Hey everyone, welcome to The Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends to question. Hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host, Michael Montalvo, and for the next few minutes we will swim through the river of time to try and find out what makes today truly unique. In this episode, we examine the events that occurred May 18th. We talk about volcanoes a bit here. Krakatoa, son of Krakatoa, Mount Tambora, and I'm pretty sure we've mentioned Pompeii, but as of this moment, I am under the weather and not in any frame of mind to look and see if that's true. If we haven't, then we will certainly do it on an episode at some point. But it should be fairly obvious as to which volcano we will be discussing today. Again, I'm fairly certain we haven't mentioned it before, but I wanted to actually learn a bit about it, so you know how it goes. The year was 1980, and on this day, May 18th, Mount St. Helens erupted, killing 57 and destroying thousands of acres of land and forever changing the landscape. In the interest in being transparent, most of this episode comes from History.com. The volcanic Mount St. Helens sits in South Washington State, and despite popular belief, is not a part of the famed Ring of Fire that Johnny Cash sang about all those years ago despite its location being in the similarly named Ring of Volcanoes that also burn, burn, burn. According to History.com and by association, the U.S. Geological Survey, Mount St. Helens began to grow at the end of the first ice age, the part after Sid, Manny, and Diego get the human baby back to his people. Over the course of history, the volcano had a number of eruptions, That number was nine, by the way. But again, this was in Washington and not Italy or a post-apocalyptic world. The most notable eruption slash explosion of the volcano, before the obvious, happened sometime between 1800 and 1857. And it was this particular one that was responsible for the creation of the Goat Rock's Lava Dome, a feature that no longer exists. Scientists had been concerned about Mount St. Helens for some time before the 1980 eruption, and many believed that the volcano became active around the start of the 20th century. Hang on, let's look at some volcanic terms. In this instance, active means a volcano that has erupted recently and is most likely going to erupt again soon. Dormant volcanoes are ones that have not erupted in a long time but may erupt again in the future, and extinct volcanoes are ones that are not erupting now and are unlikely to ever do so again. It's pretty straightforward. So scientists thought that an eruption was possible but were unsure of when it might be. So when earthquakes and small explosions began on March 20th, 1980, people began to suspect that things were shaking and moving and getting started. It began with tremors, probably caused by graboids, and soon escalated into earthquakes, with a minor eruption taking place on March 27, 1980. It was now that steam and ash began to escape the vents, and the small eruptions continued. The U.S. Geological Survey and the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network began to closely monitor it in hopes of learning about the volcano. According to C. Dan Miller of the U.S. Geological Survey, over the two months prior to the eruption, essentially what was happening was that the magma, or molten material, was moving up from some deep reservoir beneath the mountain, up into the volcano itself, and it began to grow and form what we call a dome or cryptodome inside the volcano. And that inflating body of magma, or molten material, actually broke the north side of the volcano, and began to cause the north side of the volcano to expand out towards the north. The pressure under the volcano's surface from all the molten material actually caused the mountain to bulge around 6 feet per day. Obviously, this was not a good thing. Then it all came to an explosive end when, at 8.32 a.m. May 18, 1990, The mountain shook by an earthquake followed by one of the worst landslides in history in which the entire north side of the summit began to slide down. This was soon followed by a violent explosion of gas and ash and steam, a blast that knocked over trees after stripping them bare. This was an explosion with the force of a hydrogen bomb, which sent a mushroom cloud into the sky 12 miles. I feel it's important to note here that it was a lateral blast, meaning the side of the mountain was actually blown out. 
Much like Krakatoa, the eruption changed the landscape and the cone of the volcano was completely destroyed, leaving in its place a horseshoe-shaped crater 250 feet wide, 1,700 feet lower than it had previously been. The ash from the volcano was thrown so high into the air that it drifted around the globe for two weeks. It blacked out the sun for the area and the town of Spokane, Washington, resulting in the town being shrouded in darkness as lightning crashed above in the clouds. The ash would take months to clean up at a cost of several million dollars as it scattered not only the globe, but also on local crops, causing thousands in damage. I actually have some of this ash in a souvenir container somewhere around the house. I'll have to find it. The volcanic eruptions ended by late afternoon, but by then, thousands of acres of forest were gone. Lakes were flooded, and roads, bridges, and parks were all destroyed. Mount St. Helens would continue to see smaller eruptions until the fall. So what happened in the aftermath? The area was turned into a protective research area in 1982, and throughout the 80s, a series of blasts and lava flow actually formed new domes on the mountain, although two of these were later destroyed. Mount St. Helens became active again in 2004, and in early 2005, there were small explosions from the mountain. It is very likely that Mount St. Helens will see another eruption in our lifetime, but it is unlikely that it will be of the same violence due to its now deeper crater. That's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the Year Was audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.